According to the New Testament, in uh, the Nativity narrative, it absolutely does point to the virgin birth. We are told directly that it does fulfill this prophecy. Now, we have to remember, first of all, that Isaiah, like all Israel's prophets, was prophesying for three time frames, sometimes all in the same passage or even the same verse. He was prophesying for his own time, for the first coming of the Messiah, and for the return of the Messiah. He's prophesying for three different time frames. There is no unique sign about a natural biological birth. Hence, some have suggested that the birth of the one whose name would be translated, swift as the booty, uh, strong as the prey, uh, is, is the actual fulfillment. Mahesh Shalal Hashbaz. That in some way typifies it. But it's obviously not if the New Testament tells us otherwise. And I'll explain the Hebrew background directly. Let's also understand certain other things. It had to be a sign. It had to be a sign. There is nothing unique about a woman having a baby, of course, unless it was a supernatural conception. We've pointed out multiple times that the supernatural pregnancies in Scripture, which were usually geriatric, postmenopausal, Sarah, or the or or in the epic of Rachel and Leah or the parents of uh, John the Baptist, Elisheva, Elizabeth, and Zechariah, or the parents of Samson, or of Eli the priest. Each of these cases where you saw an act of divine intervention causing a pregnancy supernaturally foreshadows and typifies the fact that the Messiah would be conceived supernaturally. They all foreshadow it in some way. Well, the conception of Jesus by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit goes back in part to the creation narrative in the book of Genesis when the Spirit moved on the water. Hence, the Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the conception of the Messiah. Again, showing a contrast between creation and new creation, as we always point out. But let's go even further with this, taking the two words. Alma and Betula. Alma and Betula. The term in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is Alma, Alma. Now, it is a term for a young woman, but by cultural implication, the young woman would be a virgin. It wouldn't be a married woman. It would be a young woman who was a Betula, a virgin. Some rabbis have tried to argue this is a misapplication of the Hebrew scriptures. It doesn't say a virgin shall conceive. In fact, they are dead wrong according to rabbinics and Jewish history. Seven times, seven times, the Septuagint, the ancient rabbis, the ancient sages who translated the Septuagint, translated the term Parthenos, Parthenos, the Greek word for Genesis. That was very much the understanding of the ancient rabbis. The understanding of the ancient rabbis and the, the sages who translated the Hebrew scriptures into the Septuagint is directly in line with what the New Testament teaches, and the New Testament is directly in line with what the ancient rabbis taught. It is only more modern rabbis who try to argue this on a linguistic point, ignoring that their assertions are not the determinations of the ancient rabbis who understood that it would be a virgin. It absolutely fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 when Jesus was supernaturally conceived as enunciated by the angel Gabriel, Gabriel. Now, there's much more that can be said about the Magnificat and the Annunciation by Gabriel to Mary that she would be the mother of the Messiah. Let me explain this by making a reference back to the book of Judges, chapter 5, and the Song of Deborah. If you look very briefly to Judges, chapter 5, and the Song of Deborah, we see a kind of psalm, a kind of poem uh, that could be put to music. And we are told in verse 24, most blessed of women is Yael, Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of the women in the tent. Blessed are you among women. This epic story of Yael in the book of Deborah took place on Har Tavor, Har Tavor, Mount Tabor. The Jezreel Valley, the Jezreel Valley where the last 
assembly of the Antichrist army for the final assault on Jerusalem will take place, the Jezreel Valley separates Samaria from Galilee. It is the agricultural belt, both ancient and modern, of Israel. On the southern axis of the Jezreel Valley, in the approximate center, is Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. There's no valley of Armageddon. It's the Mount of Megiddo. Har Megiddo, Armageddon. That's where it comes from. Play on, on the uh, Hebrew meaning. The valley is the valley of Jezreel, today called Emek Israel. And a straight 180 degree line across, going from the south to the north, from Armageddon, from Har Megiddo, would be Har Tabor, Mount Tabor, where the story of Deborah took place. It is also when Napoleon Bonaparte ascended and looked down at the Valley of Jezreel and said this would be the perfect place for the ultimate military campaign. In any event, on the north side of Har Tavor is Netzedet, Nazareth. There's only a very few miles difference between what's called Nazareth Elite, Nazareth, and Mount Tabor. So, you can picture a straight line going from Megiddo across the valley of Jezreel to Mount Tabor. And if you continue drawing that line through Mount Tabor, you come to Netzedet the Lee, Upper Nazareth. We know that the city of Nazareth, or the hamlet of Nazareth, in which Jesus lived, was on that hill. Mary, as a little girl playing there, as, as a little girl, she would have known that's where the story of Deborah took place. Everyone would have known it. Everyone would have known the epic of Deborah and the song of Deborah, Blessed are you among women, Yael. Everyone would have known it. Mary, at the time of the Macklin conception, as Catholics call it, as the conception of Jesus, probably would have been in her mid-teens, probably would have been in her mid-teens. The fact that she grew up in Nazareth, in the shadow of Mount Tabor, knowing that that's where it was said and sung and written of Yael, blessed are you among women. Little did Miriam, that's Mary's real name, obviously, Miriam, same as the sister of Moses. Little would she have imagined that one day the angel Gabriel from the book of Daniel would tell her, blessed are you among women. So she grew up in the shadow of where this blessed are you among women took place. And then it was later said of her, which she supernaturally conceived right opposite in the very shadow of where it was first pronounced concerning Yael. This was the background. It would have been astounding to Miriam, to Mary, having come from Nazareth in the shadow of that mountain, to have the angel Gabriel come and tell her those things. A virgin shall conceive, a betula. Again, in cultural context, a betula was a virgin. A single young woman was expected to be a virgin. It would have been a social disgrace if she wasn't, and technically it could have been grounds for stoning to death under certain circumstances. Uh, nonetheless, that is what the New Testament tells us. It is a direct and actual fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, 14, the virgin birth. So it is. And yes, the term betula, at least implicitly, carried the idea of the woman the young woman being a virgin in both original Judaic as well as in original Christian thought. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. I would point out that we deal with the conception of Jesus more extensively on our teaching tape, Christmas, Hanukkah, and the Return of Christ, available on the internet freely. God bless and thank you so much. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale 
that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.